A precision approach, like an ILS, is designed to get you closer to the ground before gaining sight of the runway and landing than a non-precision approach like a localizer only will. Precision approaches and approaches with vertical guidance thus typically have lower minimums. But have you ever seen an approach where the ILS minimums are higher than those for the localizer? Let's talk about it. When you fly an instrument approach into an airport on an IFR flight, you're guaranteed clearance over obstructions like terrain and obstacles, as long as you follow the ceiling and visibility minimums on the approach. For an ILS, the glide slope is designed in such a way that it begins at the final approach fix, identified by the lightning bolt symbol and typically around 1700 to 2000 feet AGL, and will allow for a constant angle descent down to a decision altitude, which can be a minimum of 200 feet with a half mile of visibility talking about CAT-1 approaches, which we're going to focus on in general aviation. This glide slope and the minimum altitudes and visibilities that go with it are very carefully inspected by the FAA to make sure that all along its course, you'll have what's called the Required Obstacle Clearance, ROC, spelled out in the approach designer's regulations. Here, the glide slope gives us just enough height to meet the required obstacle clearance above this silo. That decision altitude at 200 feet is well beyond the silo. We'd never see it if we were in the clouds down to minimums. And that's fine because we meet the ROC requirements. The localizer only approaches non-precision. The same ROC requirements don't apply. The approach designers look at obstacle clearance requirements on the intermediate segment of the approach, that's the segment before the final approach fix, and instead of a downslope, it's a level horizontal line, shown here in yellow. After the FAF, the designers will look at another yellow horizontal line, this one on the final approach segment at the minimum descent altitude, the MDA, which is typically 300 feet AGL and three quarters of a mile visibility or more. Because this is a non-precision approach, the tolerances for obstacle clearances are stricter. The ROC, indicated by the yellow bracket, is larger. Again, we have just enough clearance for that silo. Sometimes the silo can be just high enough and in just the right place where something interesting happens in the design of the approach. Let's make it a little bit taller. As you can see, neither the ILS nor LOC approach has the required obstacle clearance anymore. We'll have to change up the approach. For the LOC, that'll mean raising the MDA. Aircraft shooting the localizer approach will level off at a higher altitude and maintain that which will meet the required clearance above the now taller silo until able to proceed to the runway visually. So what do we do about the ILS approach? We could change the glide slope angle. A steeper descent would allow us acceptable clearance over the silo as we arrive at the runway touchdown zone. But look at the glide slope intercept. It would have to be way above the previous 1700 feet. The other option is to move the decision altitude up. Unlike on the localizer, the decision altitude on the ILS is a fixed point in space. It's an altitude along the glide slope. So besides just a specific altitude, it's also a specific distance from the runway, and crucially, from that obstacle. Now, instead of worrying about the required clearance over the silo, we're going to require aircraft to gain visual sight of the runway environment prior to reaching the silo, so that we can proceed down to the runway, keeping it in sight. The decision altitude will be higher, and the visibility minimum will be higher as well. Let's look at a real-world example. This is the ILS in a runway 23 at Frederick in Maryland. Just like in our hypothetical example, there's an obstruction very close to the field on the approach path. Here's the approach end of runway 23, and just a bit away from it is a silo. Notice the shadow giving you an idea of its height. It's just under one statute mile from the runway, very close to the runway centerline. Let's put the numbers from the approach plate into our illustration. The touchdown zone elevation, the height of the approach end of the runway above sea level essentially, is 297 feet. For the localizer, the MDA is 1080, and for the ILS, the decision altitude is 689. Now notice the visibilities. The non-precision localizer only requires three quarters of a mile visibility for CAT-A aircraft, while the precision ILS approach requires a full mile. It's more restrictive. Again, what this is doing is requiring aircraft on the ILS to have enough visibility at the decision altitude to not only spot the runway, but to also have the obstruction in sight. Here we're breaking out at just above the decision altitude, the runway's in sight, and we have about a mile of visibility. We could see the farm structures, and the silo would be just over here, so we're able to proceed visually, picking up the two-bar VASI on the landing approach. On the localizer, this is handled not by gaining sight of the silo prior to the visual segment of the approach, but by flying over it and then gaining sight of the runway, given the lower visibility allowed. 
Now, this, of course, means that we'll either need a steeper approach or have to land further down the runway, which is 5,800 feet long. For a Category A aircraft going 90 knots or slower, this isn't an issue. For a faster aircraft, this may be a problem and require higher visibility. Category B aircraft require a full mile, while C and D need two whole miles. In those cases, the faster aircraft will proceed visually and avoid the silo on their own. In all cases, the silo is far enough from the runway center line that the approach angle won't have to change to avoid it. Aircraft seeing the VASI light can reference that and not have to destabilize their approach. That's something we don't really appreciate looking at the two-dimensional illustration here. Most approaches with these close-in obstacles will push precision and non-precision minimums up enough that the precision numbers will still be lower. But in some special cases, like here at Frederick, the obstruction will be in just the right place at just the right height to make the non-precision minimums lower, and this is why. So next time you see this situation, remember that it's not an error and you're not in fact going crazy, it's just a quirk of the approach design.